welcome back. It's Hawkeye. And uh, today I'm going to do a review for the third film in the series, Superman 3. Now, uh, I just saw this again uh, yesterday. Um, maybe for the seventh or eighth time in my life. But, you know, I keep coming back to this flick, but... Um, no, I, I can't recommend this one. Um, it's a major downgrade to me um, after the first two films uh, in the series. But I'm going to go over the review, the stories, the actors. Um, things I actually really did like and um, thought they may be on a correct path um, within ideas of this film. Uh, but the bad, unfortunately... Uh, outweighs the good, but I'll go through uh, both uh, that I found in this film. So, uh, Richard Lester returns um, after Superman 2 to direct Superman 3. Um, it was released in the States on June the 17th, 1983, and on July the 19th, 1983, in the United Kingdom. Uh, now, the screenplay was done by David and Leslie Newman, who had worked on the screenplays of Part 1 and Part 2, so they return uh, here um, to work on the third script as well. Um, now, the budget of the film uh, was $39 million, quite a big budget. No surprise there, because the uh, first two films raked in the cash at the box office. Um, now... Translating that into today's money, uh, that would be a budget of over $119 million. So that's that's a big budget flick uh, right there. Now the box office returns, they were definitely lower than they were expecting. In saying that, they still were able to bring in $80.2 million. Um, and in today's money, that's um, over $245 million. So that's that's still a good return, or a return, not not what they were expecting. Um, uh, Richard Pryor was actually on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and talked about um, how much he enjoyed Superman, and uh, almost like I think he then also mentioned how he liked to fly with Superman and all that. And um, so Alexander and Ilya Selkin um, were very eager. <clears throat> to get Richard Pryor, big box office name, into the next picture. Um, so he was, they wanted to get him um, for the next flick. Uh, so I'm going to go through um, the story uh, here. And it shows me that mm, the story idea may have been a little rushed or a little perhaps not totally thought out, the story, the characters. But anyways, in this picture, Pryor plays August Nor Gorman, uh, a down-on-his-luck unemployed dude um, who's, when the picture opens, we're welcome to this guy. It's We're, we're showing him. Um, and it's this whole opening sequence where he, He's got no job. He's got now no money coming in. Um, so he learns by lighting a cigarette off a matchbook that he could get into computer programming. Why? Because he has no job? Um, there really is no indication to me that August or Gus Gorman is a computer genius or is any better than I think he would be at that point, which would be kind of struggling back in 1983 if he was sitting down at a computer. <clears throat> there was no indication that this guy would be really any good with that, but that's what he does. He gets into computer programming, and there you go. He shows right um, from the next scene where he's, uh, being shown how to do the job, what a whiz he is, how tremendous at this job he's going to be. So then he works for WebSco, uh, 
and he decides to embezzle over 85 G's uh, from them and the half cents um, or rounding down uh, the amounts of pay to the employees. So he decides to rake that in. Um, I was reading as well that with the number, if you do the math, that means there's around 17 million people that work for this company, which is quite hilarious because I don't think there's that many people working for this company. But anyways, that's what he's done. So in turn, uh, the CEO, Ross Webster, played by Robert Vaughn, uh, as well as his rather hateful, not too pleasant sister, Vera, uh, played by Annie Ross. Now, their siblings, they're running this company. Um, Vaughn's character to me is very much okay. We don't have Lex Luthor in this movie, let's bring this guy in who's in place of Lex and he's too much like Lex. In my opinion, they needed to bring in a super villain like General Zod, someone like that to battle against Superman while instead he battles humans and a computer at the end of the film. Um, but anyways, they these two become aware of this, and then they want to use him and his abilities with computers um, in their fight against Columbia over coffee. What? Um, by reprogramming a weather satellite. What? Um, <clears throat> of course, Superman foils the plan. So, to kind of crush the story down even further, to make a long story short, um, these villains will now create a supercomputer to battle against Superman. What? Um, the whole story just... It's just too minimized to me. Um, it's these poor decisions um, that were done within the story that do not equate to a well-told story or allow the room for the actors to carry the story further on. Um, as I said, personally, they needed to bring in a supervillain, um, not a computer. Not saying that that would not work. For example, um, I love, this is just one example. There are, you know, many others, but uh, one example is I love the film 2001 uh, by uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, and there is a computer on the space station named Hal. Um, it is a fabulous character, fabulously written. Um, I think misunderstood his character is. But in comparison to this character, or I don't even want to call them that, but the computer here, <clears throat> the difference between the two is this computer here has no soul to the character. There is no, it's just a computer um, who takes on a life of its own, but there's no soul to the character. So it, that whole plan, Superman versus the computer, it, it uh, falls flat. Uh, Ross's secretary, uh, Laura Lay, played by Pamela Stevenson. Now... <clears throat> There is a certain element I like to her character because when you're introduced to her and throughout most of the film, um, she is this beautiful, blonde, big-breasted, ditzy woman. Um, but you find out at the later of the film, or as the film progresses, she's actually quite smart. Um, and uh, not a dummy. 
So I like that turn in the character. Um, she does a good job with it. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I find like Ross Webster is in there for Lex Luthor. She's in there because there's no Miss Test Marker. Um, so once again, unfortunately, if you went with the super villains and there's a vast array that they could have just went to the comics and found, um, it may have been more successful or better than in bringing forth some more human characters for Superman to battle. Now, there is a moment where disbelief rears its ugly head to me. Um, when Gus, Gus is messing around with the weather satellite and things with computers around the states are starting to go wrong or bad, such as an ATM spitting out money for this guy, which is kind of funny, um, or walk, don't walk signs with people in uh, Metropolis um, until, uh, you know, everybody gets to go. Um, but it, when, and it, yeah, you know, it doesn't, take a genus to figure this out, but they're all happening at different times in the day. Like the ATM scene is late at night or in the middle of the night. Um, the scenes with the traffic or the pedestrians, that seems to happen early, bright in the morning. Two completely different times. Um, and it's like a scene right after the other. So it's like, okay, so um, yeah, whatever, like there's a bit of disbelief going on there for me um, about that. Now, like Superman 2, the previous entry in this series, um, they tried or attempted to have two strong stories. So that's the, the one story element. They tried to have two strong stories working at the same time. Um, and the other one is um, Clark Kent. Um, played once again by Christopher Reeve. Um, he's been called back to Smallville for a high school reunion. Um, but he decides to do a story on it for the Daily Planet. Um, now, I like this idea. I like the idea of changing the setting. Um, and Smallville is where Clark Kent grew up. There's a, a history there. Um, so I like that idea. Let's go to Smallville. And I would have been all for that. Like, hey, like, let's spend like most of or 80% of the film in Smallville. Let's go for it. Um, but that's not exactly what happens. It's more of like Smallville's in the first act, part of the second act, not in the third act at all, I don't think. I, um... But um, while there, he meets his high school crush, Lana Lang, uh, played quite well by Annette O'Toole, <clears throat> who becomes the love interest of this film. It's no longer Lois Lane. Um, a little bit on her in a moment or two, um, as well as ex-football star, uh, now piss tank, Brad Wilson, uh, played by Dan. Oh, Harley, but his eyes are firmly locked on Lana. That's who he would like um, for his love. Um, so there's a bit of friction going on, but there's never any guess as to if Lana likes Brad. She thinks he's a dank, and he is. He's not a very good guy. Well, really more played for comedy, really, um, that whole character, really. Um, but <coughs> through both of those stories, you're not uh, left enough to really carry on each of those plot lines very well. Um, so like the story as well as the romance after parts one and two, they not only do they not hit the mark, they really don't come close to hitting the mark at all in what 
by this point is expected in a Superman film. Um, it ju it just doesn't do it. Uh, now at the same time, the actors I didn't have a uh, a problem with any of the main actors in the film. It, they're they're all doing a really good job, doing the best they can. I know I think Richard Pryor was criticized for his role, um, but whereas like Christopher Reeve, I think was hey people um, enjoyed him still as Superman, but unfortunately. Sometimes you can only do so much with what you're given. Um, and yeah, I think, I think all the actors did a good job with this, with this film. So I didn't have a problem really in the acting department. Um, other than Lana's kid, Ricky, um, that character was played by, uh, Paul Kathler. Um, I didn't like his performance <clears throat> and it's likely no fault of his own because this happens in a lot of roles that are played by children and it's a kid's role. I found him annoying and a little whiny and I didn't really want him on the screen, which was too bad because his character becomes important within the film. Uh, Superman saves him while he's knocked unconscious in a field um, while combines are coming in, are about to chew him up. So he's good in the story, but I found uh, he, I found his character annoying and whiny, so um, didn't like that. Um, as I said, Lois Lane is no longer the love interest. And... She's not actually in the film very much at all. Uh, Margot Kidder's role was drastically reduced in this film. And from what I've heard, it was just sort of they wanted to go in a new direction. And I'm totally fine with that. I am cool with that. But Lois Lane is in like the first scene of the film before she jets off for Bermuda, only to return at the end of the film after everything has happened. Um, so she's in the film for like less than five minutes of screen time. Um, so she's not in this film very much. Um, now the, uh, opening sequence to the film, and this is where the credits roll. So it's no longer in the second one, the Lest Lester's version. It wasn't either. It was replaying scenes from Superman one over the credits. This one. The opening credit scene is uh, scenes within Metropolis, um, which was actually filmed in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, and it's kind of, it's slapstick, comedy, straight to the hill. Um, I thought it was okay. When I was a kid, I really loved it because uh, of the slapstickiness, the silliness of it. Um, it was okay. Um, it was funny. Um, the best part of it, for sure, in my estimation, is when Superman shows up and has to change from Clark Kent into Superman in a photo booth. And then rips the photos and gives the just the one photo of Superman to the child while taking the pictures of Clark Kent turning, turning into Superman. He keeps those. I like that. Um, but in the end, though, I must ask, does this scene actually belong in a Superman film. It definitely belongs in a comedy. Uh, Superman is action. It's a comic book uh, movie. There, there were definitely comedic elements within the first two films, but this one, there's almost too much comedy or too much attempted comedy. Um, so the opening sequence, I just questioned, does it really belong in this film? Now, a couple of <clears throat> things I leaned towards, like I quite enjoyed with this film, and it was things with the story or the character or more specifically with Superman himself. Um, I liked, it was very interesting when Superman turns back. Um, Reeve does very well in this performance. Um, where he just sort of turns the character and now it's like 
ooh, that's not Superman. That's that's like evil Superman or, you know. Um, I thought that was really interesting to see that. Um, but it all comes from Richard Pryor um, wanting to find kryptonite and give it to Superman. So he finds kryptonite and sends it off for it to be made, but there's an unknown substance within it. So he pulls out his pack of camel cigarettes, looks on the side and writes down tar and they give it to Superman. And it's not kryptonite because there's no tar in kryptonite, but it, it makes him turn bad. But it's kind of like left there. Although I read what it is, is it's like black or red kryptonite, but um, within the film, there's, not much of an uh, enough of an explanation as to exactly how the heck that happened and then i also wonder is it a message that smoking is bad especially tar look what it does to superman um but i like that the superman turning bad but it was just sort of the story getting there was a little bumpy um now perhaps I would definitely say the best scene of the film um, is when this bad Superman fights Clark Kent. Um, it's a cool scene. It must have been something back in 1983 to see that because it's Christopher Reeve versus Christopher Reeve. Um, they're fighting each other, and um, it's a really good scene. No dialogue. It's all action. It's a um, really good scene. Um, but along that same thing where it stems from in watching the film, maybe if you read the comics, Hey, that makes total sense. I can guarantee you most people in that theater would not be aware of that. So when watching the film, it doesn't make a hundred percent sense. You need to explain that. Um, how you get to this point and to me all of these problems lay within perhaps um the producers um the director um but certainly the writers perhaps not exactly knowing the material um not knowing exactly everything they need to know about superman uh, in order to make a good story, a story that makes sense, everything like that. Um, I think that's what it may come down to. And as I wrote here, much like at the end of the film, do I believe the computer would join with Vera to turn her into a computer to beat Superman or to live or whatever the heck that was. No, no, I don't. But that's what, that's what you're led to. That's the progression of this story. Uh, There's a few other things as well. Um, Ken Thorne returns to do the music of the film, um, much like he did in Superman two. And yeah, it's definitely a Superman score. You definitely are going to hum and whistle this tune after this movie played right over the final uh, credit sequence. It's a great score. Um, originally done by John Williams. Um, so yeah, the, the, the music's a knockout for sure. So, um, one thing I noticed too is in, uh, Perry White's office. Uh, that's the boss of Clark Kent played by Jackie Cooper. There's a picture of E.G. Marshall, the president from Superman two. I thought that was pretty funny pretty cool he's got a picture of the president right on the wall there so um now there were some scattered laughs in this film but like some things did make me laugh in here and it was generally uh from richard Pryor and as well as stevenson um in her turn of, of her character um there are some some scattered laughs but 
unfortunately, some of the comedy is really forced and not free flowing comedy. It just ah, some of it works and some of it doesn't. So, and then um, a couple questions I wrote down when uh, watching this film: Would rain? And this is not like blowing your gutters away like that heavy of a rain. Would a rain stop an out of control fire at a chemical plant? I don't think so. But that's what happens. That's how Superman saves the day by freezing over the top of a lake and carrying it, flying through the air and dropping it on top of this chemical plant where it melts and rains and puts out the fire. I don't think that would happen. Um, I, I really don't. Um, and then another question I had. Um, sorry if there are any children watching this. Did Superman and Lorelei sleep together? Because I think they did. But anyways, that's my review for Superman 3. Um, I admit I liked it. A little bit more than the last time I saw it. But I knew coming in, I was going to be like, uh, I'm not going to, this isn't going to be a favorable review. But I sat down and looked at what I did enjoy about the film and things I didn't really care for. So um, that was what I was left with. Now, the um, other cast members, there's Mark McClure, who returns as Jimmy Olsen as well. Um, who was in all four of the Superman films. Um, so, yeah, I think I covered all of the main actors in the film. And um, they all did a, a, a good job. But, um, but anyways, um, that's my review for Superman 3. And uh, sorry, I would just say skip it. Enjoy the first two. But I am going to watch part four. And I'll do a review for that. And you know what? I'm actually leaning towards saying, you know what? Maybe I'll watch the, the, the next Superman movies. I mean, after this, too. To a point. I'll watch the Superman Superman movies that are just Superman. Um, like the Justice League and Superman vs. Batman. I'm going to wait until I see films involving all of those characters. And then I'll get to it. Um, so, yeah. That'll be good. But anyways, uh, that was Superman 3. Have yourself an excellent day.